Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, as always, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey, man. How's it going? It's going well. And joining us today is Lee Phillips. Lee is an author, a journalist, and science writer. You find his work at Nature, Scientific American, New Scientist, Guardian, Telegraph, co-author of The People's Republic of Walmart with Mikhail Rozwarski, and author of what we're talking about today, Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, a Defense of Growth, Progress, Industry, and Stuff. Lee, thanks for joining us. Hi there. Hi, guys. Uh, glad to be here. Happy Canada Day. <laughs> Happy Canada Day. <laughs> um, no, no. I mean, we're really excited to have you on the program today, and I think we're going to get to a lot of uh, subjects. But one thing that really, um, I, I, one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on was because, you know, we've been doing a lot on the environmental movement and sort of trying to chart out a path <clears throat> as to like what a socialist uh, future might look like. And, you know, we're seeing here in Texas in particular, you know, a lot of these fights are becoming very, very real, you know, questions about having the electricity turn on when it's freezing or even hell uh, right now when it's 100 degrees plus making sure that the grill grid doesn't fail and people cook to death. Um, it, it, it's really not only brought the reality of the threat of climate change up to the forefront, um, but also for me, it has started to make me very worried because so much of the fight that we've been having on the question of environmentalism and green movement has been, well, do you believe the science or do you not believe the science, et cetera, et cetera, right? And the reality is now is that things are being done and it starts to become just as much of an important question of, are we going to do something um, as the question is like, what are we going to do um, is going to be. And I think that us on the left like need to start becoming um, a little bit more committed to actually starting to work through uh, some of these systems because we're talking nothing, you know, short of the way that we power our homes and power our society. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate your work so much um, with that because I think you take those questions really seriously. Um, and and uh, I think it's something that is a very much a, a breath of fresh air um, in the environmental movement. <clears throat> but um, before we get into the book, I did want to start on one specific question, and that's the question of nuclear <clears throat> power, um, which I think, you know, there's a lot of baggage and history around it. And I think on our side, um, I think there needs to be a very serious revisiting of some of those questions um, around nuclear power. Um, but maybe <clears throat> before we get too far ahead of ourselves, could you just maybe lay just like the very bare minimum, you know, set the stage a little bit as to why we really need nuclear power if we want to pursue any kind of serious transition? Sure. So basically, uh, for any modern society, uh, in order for our hospitals to run uh, their, you know, ventilators or diagnosis machines, for our schools to uh, have the lights on, for our factories to be able to process all the materials that they need to process, uh, the electricity needs to be available when those processes are, are, are needing to occur. Uh, we need a 24 seven electricity grid. We don't need one that is, we, don't, we can't wait for the sun to shine or the wind to blow to turn on the ventilators at the hospitals. That's elementary. That's not something that, that that's absolutely something necessary in a capitalist society, but it's also something that's necessary in any social society, if anything, because we would have a lot more, you know, social services, a lot more hospitals, public health care. Uh, one would think that, if anything, we would need this more, um, uh, or rather that the, the reliability of um, electricity is, if anything, even more essential in a social society. So that's just straightforward. Um, the problem with uh, wind and solar are fantastic. Um, similarly, uh, wave, tidal, other forms of uh, variable renewable energy, uh, because they're clean, they don't emit, or they have very low uh, carbon emissions. Um, the problem with them is that they're weather dependent, uh, that they're not available 24 seven. So in order to have a reliable grid, we have to make sure that there's another part of the grid that, it, uh, that, uh, that generates clean, still clean, uh, generates clean electricity, but is available 24 seven to, uh, to match um, the wind and solar, other variable resources when the weather isn't working in our favor. And we basically have three options here or three main options. Uh, we have hydroelectricity, we have geothermal, and we have nuclear. All three of those are super low, um, uh, have super low carbon emissions in general. I mean, it depends. There are some uh, forms of hydroelectricity um, which uh, are which have higher emission profiles, generally in the um, 
in the tropics, but that's another story. Um, more importantly with hydroelectricity and with geothermal is that they're geographically constrained. Mm -hmm. um, so I live in British Columbia, uh, where there are lots of mountains and valleys. So uh, we have a 98% clean electricity grid, one of the cleanest large economy um, grids in the world, thanks to the fact that we can fill those valleys with, uh, we, we can dam those valleys, fill them with water, and we've got clean electricity on demand. In the prairies, which is flat, <laughs> you can't have hydroelectricity. Um, <clears throat> similarly, geothermal, you need uh, to basically be in a region which is geologically active. Um, and again, that is not the case everywhere. So the Pacific Rim is great for that, but uh, elsewhere in the middle of the continent, not so, not so much. You can extend uh, the geography that is available for geothermal by using something called enhanced geothermal systems, but that involves hydraulic fracturing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the green left is very opposed to uh, fracking. Um, so <clears throat> that's a challenge. And then finally, we have a nuclear, which you can, uh, which is not geographically constrained. You can use nuclear anywhere in the world. So um, in those places where uh, you have geographical constraints that don't allow you to use a geothermal or hydroelectricity, nuclear has to, has to be part of the mix. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I mean... Uh... <sighs> And I mean, I think most people, um, you know, there's a hesitation around nuclear and I, I, I don't think it's necessarily completely misplaced. I think one of them is like maybe a little bit more squishy in the sense that it's just like, oh, this is like a big machine and it's a little scary and I might not really understand the process here. Um, but there is a very, um, you know, understandable worry when you have seen disasters like Chernobyl or Fukushima out there, where people are worried about having those in their communities. I mean, could you give people a little bit of a sense um, about one, the um, the technological advances um, that have happened in, in, in nuclear plants in, in recent decades and sort of speak to the issue of the question of, you know, of disaster that I think makes a lot of people a little bit allergic to the concept of power in their society through nuclear. Yeah. And can I just tack on there? You know, I, I remember hearing a lot of engineers talk about like the low risk of certain pipelines only for like six months later uh, mm -hmm. for those to have a leak. Right. And so I guess that's like my main concern. Like I, I'm willing to believe in the certain assurances, but there's a certain genre of a reassurance that I've sort of come to distrust on these matters. Um, OK. All right. Uh, just writing down some of your questions there. Um, so <clears throat> actually one other quick thing I should have said um, earlier, uh, what about batteries? What about um, mm -hmm. uh, yes. energy storage uh, instead? Sure, batteries are great. Uh, energy storage is awesome. Um, but we have to remember that uh, our very best batteries last just for a few hours. And there may be uh, days or even weeks on end where uh, the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't shining, or the wind is blowing too much. And uh, so we have to turn off the uh, the, the turbines. Uh, the, in you know in Japan, uh, every year there is like a typhoon period where uh, lasts for like three four days, and uh, you would have to if you had an entirely uh, variable renewable uh, energy system powering Tokyo, uh, you're not you're going to have to you would have to have uh, enough batteries to cover that gargantuan um, energy demand. For just those three days so even if you were able to uh build such a system which is a you know technologically might we don't we aren't there yet in terms of batteries um uh that is an enormous expenditure uh for just three days worth of uh of use um in a capitalist system obviously <clears throat> no private investor would want to do that but even in a, a, a social system it's still an irrational use of resources just for those three days when over here we've got this other technology that where we don't have to worry about that um <clears throat> with respect to concerns around things like fukushima waste um uh, et cetera et cetera with uh with nuclear so <clears throat> straight out of the gate um what we have to understand is that there's no such thing as uh, any energy system or energy technology or any technology for that matter that is 100% safe doesn't exist. Uh, so what you're looking for is one that has the is the most safe rather than something that is perfectly safe. And already, even taking into account um, uh, disasters like um, Fukushima and Chernobyl, 
Chernobyl. And now, also remember, zero people killed um, in, in Fukushima uh, in this industrial accident. Um, and a relatively small number of people were killed in uh, in uh, in Chernobyl, nevertheless, and I would also argue that the Chernobyl incident uh, was more a product of a uh, decrepit, corrupt, authoritarian regime, in the Stalinist regime, than any something something in technology itself. Um, but even taking into account the, uh, uh, those disasters, uh, you measure the uh, the way that you could measure any sort of the safety of any energy system or energy would be the number of deaths per unit of energy, the deaths per kilowatt hour. And uh, far and away, nuclear has the fewest deaths per kilowatt hour. It is lower even than solar. And one of the reasons that you might think that's kind of crazy, where's the danger in solar? Well, because, you know, you have to, uh, people have to climb uh, roofs and stick solar panels on roofs. And sometimes people fall off them and injure themselves or even die. Um, similarly, um, you know, um, uh, solar panels involve uh, the use of heavy um, heavy metals such as lead, cadmium, a um, number of other heavy metals. And of course, the processing of that involves um, uh, exposure to, uh, to the, the, the workers involved. And so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a death profile associated that, with that as well. So again, what we're looking for is not a purely safe, 100% um, safe energy system. The, we're looking for the safest uh, energy technologies and uh, nuclear far and away um, wins wins that battle um, in any case it isn't as if um, uh, we've stopped improving or imp uh, improving the safety uh, since uh, since this period so any uh, I, I, I don't want to throw under the bus existing nuclear because it is already like ridiculously safe but um, third generation um, fourth, and fourth generation uh, nuclear reactors literally can't melt down and it isn't like well, um that's what you say but maybe you haven't figured something out and there's a possible the the the, the what are what are called passive safe, safety systems involve things like gravity to uh to to make sure that this is walk away safe so even if there are no humans involved there the physical systems themselves physical laws um uh basically turn off the turn off the the the, the fission process for that system to fail we, the only way that it would fail, it would be the same way that uh, a, a ball could spontaneously run up a hill. It just can't happen. It's physically impossible for that ha to happen. Um, so, so that I, I, as far as I'm concerned, the the meltdown question is a box that, box that has already been ticked. Uh, that is not uh, an, an issue that we should be concerned about at all. Um, and in fact, you know, in, in terms of the debate these days, most people, that isn't really their, their main concern. The main concern really is either about radiation or, um, or, the, or, or the waste. What do we do with uh, nuclear waste? Um, let's deal with the, the radiation issue first. Um, a lot of people are very, very scared about radiation, not realizing that, um, uh, that you know, light is radiation, that um, that if you take a, 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 a return flight from New York to, to London, you will be exposed to more um, ionizing radiation than a lifetime's worth of, uh, of the same uh, exposure to a, a nuclear power plant worker. So it, it's about radiation is bad per se. It just depends like in what's the exposure level, um, what kind of radiation. And um, as, as I said, with respect to um, that single flight, the, the, the radiation danger is extraordinarily low. There are many of um, activities that we engage in um, that are far more, uh, that deliver far more, uh, far greater exposure uh, to ionizing radiation than, than living near a nuclear plant, than working in a nuclear plant for, uh, for your entire life. It's, again, it's a non-issue. Um, then uh, finally, on the issue of waste, so we're taking uranium out of the ground and then processing it, or in some cases we don't need to process it, and then using it um, in, in nuclear power plants. And then once uh, it's done, we can put it back down in the ground. Oops. Now taking that out of the ground, um, it, it, did it cause any issues uh, with respect to the biosphere? Not particularly. In fact, there there is a, um, sort of a natural um, 
react, you might say, that uh, exists in, in, in West Africa. It was a, uh, um, uh, a reserve of, of, of opinion that began self-fissioning. Now, because it was in a, uh, a location that was like a formation, a uh, geological formation that is uh, very, 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 very stable and has been stable for billions of years, uh, is basically excluded, for, separated from the rest of the biosphere. So when we uh, want to uh, take our waste and put it back down in the ground, that is the sort of formation that we're looking for. Uh, a, a, a geological formation that is, again, has been stable for billions of years, utterly cut off from uh, from the biosphere, and 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 we're good. And other possibilities are reprocessing the waste uh, that adds an additional expense. France does this at the moment, and then after the end of that processing period, the the, uh, the high level waste is. Uh, um, instead of we're talking instead of talking about tens of thousands of years. Um, before it could be, you know, held in your hand safely. We're now we're using it to about three hundred years. Mm. So there's that. So again, I would say that the uh, the waste uh, issue, whether we're uh, burying it in the ground or we're processing it, it, it that, as far as I'm concerned, there's really no um, issue with respect to any endangerment of the biosphere. But at the same time, we also have to that. Um, um, other energy processes, it's not as if other, other energy processes don't have their own waste streams that pose um, uh, issues to the rest of the biosphere, to humans uh, in particular. Um, as I said, uh, solar panels um, you involve, the, the processing of them involves uh, lead, cadmium, other, other heavy metals. At the end of their life uh, cycle, um, they end up in, in garbage dumps, often in uh, in underdeveloped countries in Asia, and kids pick o over the uh, uh, these these dumps looking for uh, for copper that can be reprocessed and sold. Of course, they're exposed to these heavy metals. Now, any defender of, of solar panels uh, or so the solar industry would say, yes, that might be true, but we can solve that problem. Excuse me, we can solve that problem. I uh, didn't mean to burp at the uh, solar uh, solar panel. <laughs> uh, the, um, we can solve that problem through good regulation. I agree, um, but then that's the same uh, sort of approach that we can do with mm -hmm. uh, to nuclear. So it's it's a matter of like what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you think that we can solve some of the um, uh, the sort of toxic uh, waste issues with uh, with a variable clean energy through regulation, we can do the same with nuclear. <clears throat> Sorry, Matt, you had something. Uh, you know, I got I got a couple things. If you want to go first, um, David. Well, I mean, I, I just also, in addition to like the actual process, I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit, um, you know, about what nuclear means, like, like for industry, because, you know, right here in, in Texas, there's a big solar explosion. And I think it's good, especially if you can find ways to do it that work at scale and aren't sort of creating a kind of boutique neoliberal like energy grid separate from everybody yeah. else. Um, but one of the points I think social should pay a lot of attention to about nuclear versus even um, something like solar or, or wind is the permanency of good union jobs that can come with nuclear, yeah. right? Um, versus something that, you know, one of the problems, like the the solar industry right now, working conditions are very poor, um, <clears throat> non-unionized, et cetera. Um, and also, you know, you're only showing up in an area for a very short amount of time. So especially if you want to scale outside of just like the big, cities and metro areas right it's hard to make those jobs sort of be local um and like create development for the community versus the nuclear plant which is like that's not moving um you know down the street anytime in the near future right that has like a very very serious planning potential <clears throat> of being able to say okay here's a community we can create very stable well-paying union jobs for folks versus something that as it works right now it's sort of coming in uh, to a community for a very short period of time and then moving on um but uh, I, 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 I think that like thinking about this labor question, too, is something that we should also be considering in addition to just the, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of how much energy we're producing, and how we're producing it. Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, there are uh, there are people who would say, well, anybody who's a, who's working in the solar sector, or the wind sector, um, uh, they need too, and they need decent wages, too. And I would absolutely agree. But mm -hmm. at the same time. We have to recognize, and any trade unionist will tell that um, one has to be strategic and recognize that there are some industries that are more easily unionizable than other ones. Mm -hmm. That uh, a, uh, also that a union is not a magic wand that suddenly turns a uh, uh, nine dollar twelve 
dollar an hour unskilled uh, job into a hundred thousand dollar year um, mm-hmm. uh, permit uh, position. This even you, you know the strongest union be able to to transform that uh, that job, uh, uh, th- this other kind of a job. And the reality is that uh, the nuclear power plants. We, uh, a friend of mine talks about um, the uh, the parking lot issue. Like if, if you go to a parking lot at a nuclear power plant, you're going to see dozens, hundreds of, of parking spots because this is a very large um, uh, uh, workplace. Against it, um, if you unionize it, and there's an effort on the part of the employer to uh, to deunize it, to uh, 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 it is much harder because joining of workers the workplace. Uh, whereas a small workplace, it's harder to maintain the union there because there's constant mm-hmm. turnover. Um, if you just have a, you know, a, a small handful of, of workers who are convinced to be uh, a, against the union, um, you lose that shot very quickly. Uh, with a large workplace, uh, it, once you have a union, it's really hard to get rid of, which is one of the reasons, obviously, why uh, employers uh, fight tooth and nail against a uh, unionization in those, work, in those work, workplaces in particular. Um, uh, nuclear power plants create family supporting, um, long community supporting uh, jobs that, uh, you know, if we, we know that we have to get rid of uh, coal fired plants, what if we drop in small modular reactors into those, uh, those boiler systems, um, in allowing those communities to maintain themselves? What if we um, speak to the coal mining workers and maybe they do need to, to, to move, but uh, we can maintain uh, mining jobs, the same sort of skill set with respect to the extraction of uranium or um, other minerals and materials needed for the, the, the clean transition, which also that that's true for, for, for wind and solar as well. But this is a sort of package of, of ideas that a socialist um, needs to be thinking about very seriously with respect to the just transi- transition. We can't just um, call our plan a just transition and then never really deliver on it. Um, mm-hmm. Workers in those sectors and the trade unions that represent them are very aware of the challenges that they face. And they have built uh, endless, um, you know, with four decades worth of promises of just transitions, not just with respect to um, uh, decarbonization, but with anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the promises from uh, you know uh, smart talking, uh, f- fancy educated people from the coasts, um, and never delivering it uh, on it. Uh, there's been betrayal after betrayal after betrayal. It is no wonder that they do not trust um, discussions of a just transition and a green new deal, even though the very idea of a green new deal in the first place was to focus on ensuring that the frontline workers in uh, the fossil sector were taken care of, that they would not bear the burden of the clean transition. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm just like, this is some criticism I've been lobbing to our own side here in Texas that like a lot of times people have treated the just transition as like not really a commitment, but an answer to a question, if you get what I mean. You know, okay. like it's um, in the sense that like the just transition has to go from being just like a slogan to like a real commitment for folks. Yeah. And if people are working in industries where they're seeing like, you know, people who do organizing here in Texas are seeing what's going on with solar installation across the state. And it's bad. Um, and the fact that they're able to negotiate special deals with the government um, to preclude them from, for example, <laughs> um, you know, public uh, competition or where they're sourcing their things or just being able to skirt basic work requirements and safety requirements for folks. Like we need to be showing up right now instead of just saying we're going to flip um, a switch and we have a slogan here. Like the Just Transition needs to be an actual commitment because as you were saying, like people are very well um, aware of the the forces that they're up against. And the, the nice thing, though, is like we do have solutions to these things, but we yeah. as a left need to get a lot smarter about promoting these and talking about what this actually looks like versus just like, um, you know, we have like a nice policy proposal if you look on page 25 of, you know, yeah. our, our Green New Deal handbook, right? Yeah. <laughs> you, we, uh, we need to make sure that we are speaking to industrial unions um, mm-hmm. from the very beginning, uh, before we develop our, our, clean, our Green New Deal plan. Not, we come up with our Green New Deal plan in the, in the boardrooms of some NGO or think tank or um, uh, you know, with some grad students. Or, and then after that, uh, you know, the, as a second thought, say, okay, hey, unions, what do you think about this? And then in, when we do that, and some industrial unions or transportation unions or energy sector unions push back and say, this wouldn't work, this wouldn't work, this wouldn't work, we don't like this. Um, our response should not be, 
oh, they're just being very conservative. They're, they've been bought mm -hmm. off by the bosses. This is business unionism, which is what you always hear. When the you know, uh, building trades uh, in California had a protest um, outside the Democratic Convention uh, a couple of years ago against the Green New Deal, uh, the response in, in some left-wing magazines was that these are just, okay, they're just conservative uh, trade unionists. I'm, I'm not going to be saying that um, all workers, by dint of being workers, are automatically noble and visionary and uh, everything they say is correct. I mean, they're just some vulgar workers and known. But the point is that you, um, you shouldn't also go on the other, uh, the flip side and assume that any time that uh, workers dis or, and their unions disagree with something that's come up and in, in, uh, that's been developed in a, a think tank or NGO is it's because they're being conservative. It could possibly just might, yeah, might possibly be that these uh, these workers having uh, you know, a lifetime of experience in uh, many lifetimes of experience in uh, the very systems that you want to transform are responding to your suggestions because they know them so well and say, this isn't going to work. Also, you're undermining our, our jobs by doing this. Meanwhile, over here, this thing that does also deliver this set of technologies or processes that also delivers a clean transition. In fact, if you look at the evidence, and we have because we know the, the, these systems very well, it will deliver much lower emissions and will work compared to your solutions. Uh, meanwhile, we can both preserve our jobs or preserve the type of jobs that we, um, uh, we can do. So a great example of this would be, um, I've lost track of how many times I've seen anti-aviation campaigners. There's, uh, you know, the Extinction mm. Rebellion in the UK. There is um, uh, Plain Stupid uh, from a few years ago, and now the straight Stay Grounded campaign. All of them are trying to reduce or eliminate aviation. Even AOC's original FAQ on the Green New Deal included a, a section about um, uh, eliminating aviation, replacing it with, uh, with high-speed rail. Now, I think to her credit, she pulled that back, and I think this was produced by some staffer and didn't really think it through. But... Um, uh, what we need to be talking about uh, with respect to aviation, we need aviation, um, both for freight and for passengers, for migration, for to be able to participate in, in national democracy. How are um, uh, union delegates from Hawaii um, or Guam or, or Puerto Rico going to be able to participate in their national union meetings um, by sailboat uh, to get to the mainland? Um, there's this sort of, bizarrely, there's some sort of, there's a, there's something of a sort of colonial mentality as well buried within this, and uh, just forgetting about Hawaii, forgetting about Guam, forgetting about Puerto Rico and so on and so forth. But, um, instead what we should be doing is developing clean fuel, genuinely clean fuels, um, either, uh, whether we're talking about synthetic hydrocarbons or, uh, ammonia or, uh, pure hydrogen. There's a range of different options here, and I'm not going to be, I, I could spend an hour talking about the, their, uh, their pros and cons. Never, the point being that there, it, there's a feasible path to, uh, to genuinely clean aviation, uh, long haul. Um, in addition, um, uh, heavy transport shipping, um, uh, we know that we can't electrify that. Ain't no charging stations in the middle of the Pacific. Um, so in the process of producing clean fuels for aviation, we're also building an, uh, an industry uh, for uh, the uh, very necessary clean fuels for, um, for shipping. And, uh, oh, by the way, if you're a pipe fitter or uh, you have the skill set from the oil and gas sector, uh, that is equally applicable in terms of skill set, uh, pay, unionization, uh, unionizability, unionization rates, um, or in principle could be um, as the uh, the oil and gas sector. So mm. uh, the, the workers uh, in the oil and gas sectors can see themselves in a low carbon economy in a way that they don't see themselves when all they when all the activists talk about is uh, we need to get rid of aviation and everybody should just bicycle everywhere and uh, ride, uh, ride buses. I, mean, I think bikes and buses are great, but obviously they're, they're not the entire different story. Yeah, and I mean, go ahead. Man. You go ahead. Oh, I mean, I because I, I, I'm sort of itching to get to some of the subject matter in, in in your book, but just trying to to stick with nuclear for just a moment. Um, sure. I'm just we we don't have to spend um, too too long on this because we have a lot else to get to. But one thing that that is sort of worrying to me about the current state of plays because I I've been very convinced about the the need um, 
for nuclear for not just the immediate future, but also, you know, for the long term to build up this kind of socialist future, which is a promise of like real abundance for working people, which is very different from the kind of liberal anti growth mindset that, that we're starting to see. But we'll get into all that in a moment. Because what what frightens me, though, is that instead of seeing nuclear growing right now, we're actually starting to see it start to contract um, in, in both this country and, and in Europe with some pretty serious uh, consequences. So, I mean, we, you know, maybe just like, you know, a couple minutes, if you could just give people like a sense of, of what the current state of, of nuclear power is, both in the U.S. and, and maybe abroad, just so people can see, yeah. can understand just like, how, how serious and how much movement uh, in the anti-nuclear realm there has been over the past few years. Sure. So basically everywhere that nuclear plants have closed, the, the energy that they produced uh, has not been replaced by renewables. Um, overwhelmingly, it is produced by fossil fuels. Uh, if we look at uh, Germany at the moment, um, you know, struggling through a very severe energy crisis, in part as a result of the, uh, the Ukraine war, um, instead of turning back on their nuclear power plants, they're restarting coal-fired power plants. In Belgium, uh, the government is, uh, it's a coalition government, but the energy minister is a green uh, party uh, minister, very anti-nuclear. Um, they are turning off, as a result of that, they are turning off their nuclear power plants and um, building new uh, natural gas uh, plants. Um, it's a world turned upside down that the, the the very people who are supposed to be leading the charge with respect to uh, the fight against climate change are making it worse uh, by um, being single mindedly. They were they're They're more opposed to nuclear than they were in favor of fighting climate change. Hmm. Um, you know, in New York, the, the closure of uh, Indian Point, I, I, I can't remember the exact um, numbers off the top of my head, but it's something like 20 percent increase in uh, carbon emissions over the previous year. Double check that. It's probably some, th something slightly different from that um, as a result of the, the, the closure of that nuclear plant, because you need to maintain um, uh, grid reliability. And in a world where, uh, you know, the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't always blow, in order to firm up that grid to make it reliable, you have to depend on fossil fuels. Um, there's some good news as well. Um, uh, there, you know, uh, South Korea has gone pretty much all in on on, on nuclear um, as a result of the of just building the same design over and over and over again. The learning involved without them the, uh, using the same workers, uh, they're driving the cost uh, uh, cost down in the same way that uh, repeated production of uh, solar panels and wind turbines uh, have, has dri radically uh, driven the cost uh, curve down uh, for those technologies. And that's basically what we need to be doing uh, with nuclear here to keep, uh, uh, to, to keep the cost down with nuclear. Um, yeah. The one thing I would say about uh, cost, which is really uh, useful to keep in mind, particularly from a left perspective, is um, the United States, Canada, Western Europe, uh, as a result of neoliberalism and um, so, yeah, basically ne neoliberal fear of large grand projects uh, delivered by the state, we've gotten out of the business of doing that. And mm -hmm. uh, that is primarily what is what is what is driving the costs up, because if you don't have a workforce that is used to uh, building these things, um, they have to relearn it every single time, which increases the, 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 the time it takes to build it, which increases the cost. Um, and so another sort of frustration that I regularly have on, on the green left is that where I don't think they're being left wing at all, I think they're being de de deeply neoliberal in this sort of automatic fear of mega projects. That anytime there's any mm -hmm. mega project, they talk about cost overruns. Um, uh, they talk about the, you know, um, uh, the the idea of of the state domineering society and i think in many respects this just um reflect is a reflection of sort of hayekian um uh sort of neoliberal conceptions of what the state can and can't do um we should be absolutely aware that the state uh isn't automatically um in the interest of, of working people if it isn't fully democratically controlled but if it is, then it's. I, I, and let me put it another way: it's an uh, it's a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah.
yeah, I guess I think that's probably good in terms of um, response on the cost stuff and where we're at, the state of play with nuclear. Yeah, because I mean, I will say that that was one of the questions I had, which is uh, I, I see a lot of anti-nuclear uh, pro-renewable folks say, you know, just the cost. It's falling behind on yeah. the cost stuff. And, you know, it reminds me of an essay. I think it was anti-nuclear, but by Langdon Winner uh, called like, Do Artifacts Have Politics? And it talks about this nuclear plant. And it says, and the analysis is correct. Um, I think is, is I, I think I agree with you more about like nuclear. But his analysis was, the existence of nuclear power uh, it sort of um, implies the existence of state that is like in control of something like that, and a workforce that is highly skilled and able to yeah. run that. And like those, I think those are. I think the difference we have is like those are good things that we should yeah, be yeah. working towards. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, one of the uh, the great problems that we faced during the the, the pandemic was the, the 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 hauling out of state capacity. I mean, that's a mm-hmm. piece of political jargon, but it basically means the ability of the state to do things. Um, and uh, you know, good outcomes uh, in the pandemic don't really map easily to a left wing government or right wing government because of so much of this hauling out of state capacity. Um, but uh, in those locations where things did have better, relatively better outcomes, it was in those locations in the world where there had been some sort of retreat from um, neoliberalism or uh, hauling out of state capacity, um, uh, or there had never been um, a full sort of neoliberal, neo- neoliberalization. So I'm talking about places like uh, Taiwan or South Korea. Uh, it, just to pivot here just for a second, um, those locations were... Uh, were hit by SARS-1 in around 2003-2004. And uh, a lot of the assessments that were uh, done after the end of that pandemic, that local pandemic, um, one of the sort of villains in the piece was identified as uh, the part privatization of healthcare systems had fragmented those healthcare systems, making it much harder for them to respond. And one of the recommendations was to uh, to reverse course with respect to neoliberalization, uh, to re- restore state capacity. Mm-hmm. And anyway, that's a bit of a shaggy dog story and pivoting away from the questions of energy. That feels like a fairy tale. I got to jump in there, though. Like seeing a country respond to something like that so um, responsibly <laughs> and take like the actual lessons from it is it feels like I'm watching a, like a Disney movie. <laughs> I mean, we've got to understand. I mean, the, I think it would be too much to to say that South Korea and ta- Taiwan and so, and a number of other uh, sort of states in in uh, in the region are social democracies. Uh, what I would say is that they have developed uh, in a much more inter- uh, state interventionist way, um, and we should on the left have a look at what worked and what didn't work with that in the same way that we often talk a lot about Norway and Sweden and Finland and Denmark and Canada. I think it's about time that we begin to consider some of the interesting things that have happened with economic planning um, in the uh, the free and democratic uh, parts of, uh, of, of Asia uh, along those lines. Um, oh, back to uh, questions around cost and nuclear. One last thing I wanted to say is that it's not merely that um, the left should be embracing nuclear. Nuclear needs the left um, precisely because the uh, it, nuclear is very, very cheap um, once it's up and running uh, because of the incredible energy density of its fuel. Um, but uh, the, uh, the the upfront capital uh, costs are, are are considerable, just as they are with uh, hydroelectric dams. And so market actors are very reluctant to engage in that huge mm-hmm. initial outlay of considerable costs, whereas the state is much more comfortable with that and could do it much more cheaply. <clears throat> so conventional nuclear really does need a strong state to make it work, even though over the long haul, it ends up being much cheaper. Um, uh, the reason that it, we talk about um, uh, wind and solar being super, super cheap, it's true that they're super, super cheap at the moment for the service that they provide, but they do not provide the same service as hydroelectricity or nuclear or geothermal. Those three deliver uh, clean electricity that's firm. Um, the other provides elect- uh, clean electricity that is variable. Um, and so it needs to be backed up with something. So the full cost, so that it's, anyway, let me put it another way. We on the left are always aware of the difference between price and cost. The cost to society of, of something is, mm-hmm. is often very different from the price in the marketplace. 
similar just because the price of wind and solar is very very low doesn't mean that that captures the entirety of the cost to the system if you have to back that up with something else then that cost is much is much larger and so the full cost of uh wind and solar has to include that backup and once you do that mm -hmm. then uh, nuclear uh, begins to, uh, to be much more um uh, rational um from a cost perspective one uh, final thing i got oh, uh, sorry what, oh. tiny last little thing with uh, oh, conventional nuclear with small modular reactors which potentially could be uh, built um in factories on an assembly line and then that um is much more market friendly let's say because there's a lot less uh, upfront capital investment required on the part of uh, the company we aren't there yet that technology hasn't been delivered yet uh, i mean it does exist in um in submarines and um aircraft carriers and icebreakers and small modular reactor uh, research reactors at universities <clears throat> but in terms of uh, at a commercial level it doesn't exist yet and so we still need the state to take the <clears throat> to use economic planning to shepherd that from pilot projects and lab bench through to uh, commercial viability so once again you still need a much more confident left-wing government that, uh, that mm -hmm. is, uh, is is perfectly at ease with using the levers of government to, uh, to, de uh, to deliver something. So whatever we're talking about, whether we're talking about conventional nuclear, big scale, or small modular reactors, advanced reactors, we still, uh, nuclear needs the left as much as the left needs nuclear. Uh, one final question just on, you know, sources for these minerals. Does it got to be uranium? Uh, I remember hearing a lot about thorium uh, five or six years ago. Is that a possibility? What What's the state of play there? I mean, I, I don't think there's an, necessarily anything wrong with thorium. Um, thorium may be um, something that uh, makes uh, nuclear very attractive to a place like India, which has considerable thorium resources, not much in the way of uranium resources. But um, the one thing that I would just very quickly push back on is that uh, there is an argument that we don't need to worry about uh, uranium and all its, 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 its bad issues because we have thorium instead. And, you know, uranium's fine. There's nothing really wrong with it. Uh, it there's, in, in this space, there are a lot of... Uh, um, uh, folks who will say, let's talk about um, small modular reactors instead of conventional nuclear because it solved all these issues and we won't have the pushback from the green left anymore. Or um, let's talk about um, uh, thorium instead of uranium. Or let's talk about um, uh, advanced geothermal, which is much more geographically available, instead of nuclear. Um, and in each case, the, the, the partisans of those particular technologies think that once we explain um, how this particular new technology solves the issues that you worry about with respect to conventional nuclear or whatever it happens to be, that they, the, the opponents will say, oh, OK, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy with this. No, no, no. They were opposed for irrational reasons for, uh, with respect to the first technology, which means that they will be opposed uh, for irrational reasons for this other technology or this other technology, no matter what you come. Another one is uh, people will talk about mm. fusion and nuclear fusion instead of nuclear fission. <clears throat> um, thinking that the green left will finally like uh, say, yes, that give the green light and that we're happy with, with nuclear fusion. No, 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 because <clears throat> there are, uh, it, it requires uh, tritium. Uh, it's an isotope of hydrogen. Don't want to go into details of, of that, uh, about that. Uh, that is radioactive. It's very mildly radioactive, but it is radioactive. And uh, so already you see the green left uh, saying, no, no, we don't want fusion either. Um, they do, it's irrational. They don't care. It's not uh, a technology that you can come up with that, which makes them happy. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I'm a little bit too cynical there. No, I, I, you know, I, I could see how that's uh, that way that, that conversation has played out. It's, I, I see the patterns there. <laughs>